So can you tell us about Stanford undergrad and why that was unique? Yeah, so I arrived at Stanford with a eight week old. Um, I was basically the second undergrad that they had had arrive at campus, um, you know, second undergrad ever arrive at campus with a kid. Um, and, you know, so that was a very unique experience. I was a very young mother. Um, I my my ex-husband you know he was in the military so he wasn't here either it was really just me um and and my daughter and so it meant that you know i didn't have a lot of the normal undergrad experiences i had very different experiences than many of my peers uh which tulsi can tell you totally worked out for our crew because it meant that we had you know our own digs and a little baby to play with um which was you know really fun and i um I found it to be really uh, sobering. I think when you're in undergrad, it's easy to get really wrapped up by like grades or other, you know, metrics that you've always used to measure yourself. Um, And basically from the very start, I had a perspective where I was able to step back and be like, okay, school really matters, but there are other things that matter. So it it has, it goes back to that balance thing. I I was able to maintain that from the start. Um, And I had to learn how to ask for help. Right. So whether it was calling, um, you know, a family member and saying, hey, I have finals coming up. I'm going to be really busy. I need extra support. Can you please like come out and support me? Um, And being able to kind of ask for what I needed very early um, and identify when I needed help, I think was extremely valuable. Uh, Although I wasn't as good at it in the beginning. I remember. I was standing with with two of the professors in the mechanical engineering department and you know one of them was like oh did you see Rachel's you know capstone project like was kind of bragging about it to this other professor as, as we stood there and he was like yeah I just I can't believe she did all of that and is raising a kid and this other professor turned to me and he was like I didn't know that you had a kid and I was like well yeah it was never relevant and he was like well you never asked for an extension you never asked for help you never like needed any of these things and I'm like well sometimes I need help sometimes I don't and like so Um, it was really empowering to me to be able to say, okay, I have this unique circumstance and I am able to set the boundaries about when I ask for, um, help and when I don't and who gets to know things about what's in my personal life and who doesn't and, and all of that. Um, I think that that, that was valuable. And I feel like for so many of Stanford undergrads, a lot of the experiences, oh, I'm going to go abroad, I'm going to go out to the row and party until 1 or 2 a.m. I'm going to do all of these number of things, which I imagine yeah. for you, you might have had to think twice about. And so Absolutely. did that weigh on you at yeah. all? Like, oh, I feel like my undergrad experience is so much different in a better yeah. or worse way. So for me, um, I actually, so I grew up in southern New Mexico in a fairly small town. Um, and I had actually started college classes when I was in high school. Um, because I had asked the school board, basically, like I basically posed to the school board, like, here are the metrics. Our school is multiple grade levels behind, you know, the rest of the U.S. I'm going to be really far behind. Please let me go take classes at the university. And so, so it was, they were flexible enough that they created a program where I could go to the university. And so I had a few of those kind of very undergraddy experiences in high school. Uh, and so by the time I got to college, I had no FOMO on like the college parties. I knew it was totally not my scene. There were all sorts of things that like happen on campuses with undergrads. And, um, and to me, it just seemed like a bunch of unnecessary drama and exhaustion and poisoning your body and like all sorts of things that I wasn't interested in. Um, in terms of you know, studying abroad, I did actually, right? So I went, uh, I did the study abroad in Beijing. Um, You know, I was able to do that when, um, you know, Nayana's dad had moved back to Texas and was close enough to my family. And so we were, um, she was able to go live there for a few months um, while I, I went to Beijing. And so there's really nothing that I felt like I missed out on. Um, but that also just has to do with my personality, right? A lot of the stuff, the like stuff that I missed out on uh, were not things that I would have been doing anyway. So, yeah. Um, and so you majored in mechanical engineering. And That's obviously correct. you were academically gifted prior. To, you took a bunch of college classes in New Mexico, where you're from. Um, when you came to Stanford, how did you decide mechanical engineering versus another kind of engineering or even a non-engineering major? Yeah, so I actually came to Stanford thinking I wanted to do AeroAstro. 
Um, I, you know, a private, I fly planes, right? I've always loved airplanes. I've always loved space. Um, I grew up, my mom, you know, worked on satellites and rockets and I, I grew up going to see those launches. And, um, so I, I have a soft spot in my heart for space, um, and for, for aerospace. And so, you know, I thought that was going to be the right path. And then I actually started to spend as much time as, as the professors would give me with a bunch of different AeroAstro professors, you know, just like emailing them and saying, hey, uh, is there any chance you have half an hour in your schedule? I'd love to ask you about what you do and learn more. Um, and what I realized was a lot of the work in AeroAstro, um, and, and of course it's a very broad field, but a lot of it includes a lot of computer simulations, um, which certain fields of mechanical engineering do as well. Um, but I am not the kind of person who can f like sit at a computer and focus on a problem like that. Um, I tend to do better with a higher amount of chaos. Um, you know, I love uncertainty. I love dealing with really complex, you know, intertangled human, um, like requirements for things. I love, you know, really um, the the combination of complexity and uncertainty and exactly what they were trying to do with a lot of their work was remove uncertainty and complexity, right? Or add complexity, but remove uncertainty, right? And it's like, here are the variables, here are the things we we're trying to do. And it's a very exact sort of work, um, which I realized wouldn't be a good fit for me. Um, I think one of the most powerful things an advisor said to me in undergrad uh, was Banny. And actually it was his class where, where your wife and I met. Um, and he, you know, I was kind of having this, this crisis about this is what I thought I wanted to go do. And now I don't think this is what I want to do. Like, I don't know, like I feel really lost. Um, and the way he framed it was, you know, you've always loved airplanes. You always will. Um, you're always going to love space, but it doesn't have to be a part of your career, you can always have hobbies. And so it's okay to say like, this is not how I want to spend my day today um, in terms of my professional life. And you can still keep things as part of your own, you know, kind of broader subset of activities in your life. Um, and I had never really framed it that way. I thought, well, this is a very complex thing. Um, this is something that either it's your profession or it's like not part of your life. Um, and that was really, uh, broadening for me because I realized, oh, not everything has to fit perfectly into these boxes of like, this is what I do for my work. Therefore, this are, these are the things that I learned. Therefore, these are the things that I go do. Um, and so that was really helpful that I was able to say, oh, okay, this isn't necessarily a loss. Like I'm not losing um, Aero Astro. I'm putting it in a different sphere of my life and I feel okay about it. Um, so yeah, so then I, I ended up in the mechanical engineering program because they have something called product design, um, which, you know, if anybody's heard of design thinking, David Kelly, who is really like the godfather of design, uh, he's the one who runs the program at Stanford. So I was really lucky to have him as a professor. Um, and the way, the way that I really decided that was the right program for me was they would always talk about these like wicked problems or really like problems that are super complex because humans are invo involved and humans are like really illogical. Uh, designing for humans is really hard. Um, it's not like designing, you know, a, a subset of like a, an aerospace system or any sort of like mechanical system. If you're designing for humans, like you, you have to do human centered design. And um, especially if you're designing in complex environments, you're designing for a bunch of different humans that all have to buy into it. And uh, I found that was the right amount of trying to impose structure on chaos uh, that I really loved. And so did that for undergrad, found I loved um, manufacturing. So we got exposed to a lot of different pieces of the puzzle and um, I really enjoy efficiency. Like if I walk into a manufacturing facility and it is perfectly set up and they do all sorts of clever things to be wildly efficient, um, it like, it gives me like a visceral emotional reaction because it makes me so happy. Um, so I found I really loved manufacturing. So I did that for my master's. Uh, and then my, my PhD was a, a whole other subset of, <laughs> of wild opportunities um, in terms of, in terms of how I got there. But yeah. And um, one of the things that's clear about your story is how deep of an 
deep of an attachment you have to Stanford and the people there in particular. Yeah. Uh, because like when we talk about Geosite, it, it'll become clear to people watching that Geosite really came out of the relationships that you developed at Stanford and the ideas that you had there. And you obviously <clears throat> had a pretty close relationship with your advisor. So what advice do you have to students in terms of making relationships and making the most of opportunities at a place like Stanford? Yeah, I think um, one of the the like mindsets that I got, and I, I don't think it was early in undergrad, it was probably late undergrad, maybe into my master's when I really learned this, was when you feel that like slight prickle that you feel intimidated by somebody, um, that's usually when I'm like, ooh, I want that person around me. Um, so that was that was one piece of it was there were incredible people doing lots of different things. But when I found somebody that was like, like far better than I was at something that I wished I could be good at or or even somebody who was like really good at something that I knew I would never be good at. Um, I just found that so deeply impressive. Those were the people I, I tended to um tended to stay really close with, right? Um, are these people that, that now I look at them and they're off in all their careers and they're like one of our, my classmates ran for Congress. I like, that still blows my mind. Um, you know, it's like, they've gone off and done such different, extraordinary things. Um, and so I think forming those relationships is really important. I also wasn't necessarily, um, very extroverted until late in undergrad. Um, I think throughout, you know, my early education, I was kind of an anomaly uh, in most of my schools. And so it wasn't like I had a large group of friends who had um, the same outlook on education that I did. And so getting to Stanford, that took a little bit of learning that like, oh, the people here care about learning as much as I do. Um, and, and to really come out of my shell probably took a couple of years. Um, but then after that, yeah, it's like just being genuine with people about what you're curious about and what you know and don't know and what you hope to learn uh, gets you really, really far.